there in Psalms chapter 2, and if you would, uh, actually just keep something there, we'll get back to it, but I'm going to remind us of what the Bible says here in Romans chapter 2, verse 8, where the Bible reads, But of them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but are unrighteous, indignation and wrath. So, there in Romans chapter 2 it says, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth. So the problem with these people in Romans chapter 2 is not that they're contentious, but it's that they're contentious and do not obey the truth. So it's not just being contentious, because a lot of times people will say, you know, if that person's contentious or to have any kind of, to be contentious in any way is a negative thing. The Bible's showing us there in Romans chapter 2 that being contentious and not obeying the truth is what the problem is. See, there's a different, there's two different types of contention, and that's what I want to preach about tonight, right and wrong contentions, right and wrong contentions. There are good forms of contention, and then there are bad forms of contention. And of course, contention is anytime we are contending with somebody, obviously, we would think of, you know, you could think in the boxing world, somebody's coming up to the ranks is going to contend for the belt, what are they going to do? They're going to challenge the other one. They're challenging the champion. So that's really what we mean by contentions. It's when people are challenging another person, when they're resisting, when they're opposing, when they're arguing, when they're uh, going against somebody else's will or uh, whatever it may be. They are, that is a form of contention. And what we want to de determine tonight, what is the right kind of contention and what is the wrong kind of attention, or, uh, excuse me, contention. So it's up to us really to understand the difference. We have to go to the scripture and we have to look at the Bible in its entirety and say, what is a good contention and what is a bad contention? What makes them good and what makes them bad? It's important to understand because we all kind of are by nature contentious beings, some of us more so than others, but you know, we all kind of have a self-will about us. We all kind of want things our way and sometimes that might go against the grain. It might go against uh, what another person in our life, whether it's a in a home or a business situation or even in a church or, or whatever it might be, our will might go against somebody else's and it might turn into a form of contention. And the thing about uh, contention is that they have consequences. You know, if we have contentions, there's consequences for better or for worse. And it's important that we understand the difference between a good contention and a bad contention because of the fact that contentions cause conflict. I mean, that's the very nature of uh, being contentious. You know, there's some kind of conflict taking place. So we need to understand that, con uh, that contentions have consequences and that they cause conflict between good and bad, they, between the righteous and the wicked, between saved and unsaved. They cause, uh, uh, they, they are, uh, they cause conflict between friends, between family members, between co-workers, church members, spouses, children. So it's important that we understand the difference between a good contention and a bad contention. And the Bible shows us the difference here. If you would, uh, you're there. Well, it just keeps up in Psalms 2 for a moment here. But we're going to look first of all at bad contentions. What is a bad contention? Well, what, what we see here in Psalms chapter 2 is we see a bad, a, an example of bad contention in the wicked contending with the righteous. The wicked contending with the righteous. And this manifests itself when people are resisting and opposing God's word. When they're opposing the preaching of God's word, the commandments of God's word. That is a bad contention. That's something not. That's not something we want for ourselves. We don't ever we don't want to be, you know, uh, found to fight against God. And there's a lot of this going on today. And it's some. It's nothing really new. The Bible says there in Psalm chapter two and verse one. Why do the heathen heathen rage and the people imagine uh, vain thing? Uh, the kings of the earth set themselves together, uh, set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointing, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So he's saying there that this taking, uh, breaking the bands asunder and casting away the cords and taking counsel against the, the Lord and against His anointed, what does God call that? He calls that uh, a vain thing. See, so it's a vain thing to contend with God because it's a losing battle ultimately. We might think that we're getting away with it and the world might think today as they cast off uh, you know, biblical doctrine, as they might cast off biblical principles uh, and, and, and resist God and, re, and resist the Bible, they might think that that's a good thing, but God says it's vain. And one day that uh, they'll understand why it's vain, because God ultimately is going to win. But we see this throughout Scripture. The Pharisees, they often contended with Jesus by trying to catch Him in, in His words. 
And ultimately, what did they end? And they were so contentious with the Lord that they even ended up crucifying. I mean, they arrested him, they lied about him, they tortured him, and then they crucified him. So contention in a bad form of it is when we see people that are resisting God, resisting God's Word, resisting the clear teaching of God's Word. That is a type of bad contention. Now, if you would, turn over to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. <laughs> when you get something in Proverbs, just keep something there. Because we're going to spend a lot of time in Proverbs towards the end of the sermon. There's, there's a lot that the Bible has to say about contention in the book of Proverbs. So, <clears throat> we see here that, you know, contention is something that can be bad when it's word, when it's a contention against God, against the Lord. And what makes it especially as bad is when the righteous do not fight back. I mean, it's bad enough when you have wicked people contending with the Lord and with His anointed and with His people and with His word. What's really bad is when the righteous just roll over and let them do it, and they don't stand up. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, verse 1, The wicked flee when no man pursue it, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. We're going to see here in a minute that a form of good contention is to stand up for the faith, to stand up for the Word of God. To be, I mean, yes, they're being contentious with us, and a lot of people seem to have adopted this notion of pacifism, in, in, you know, as far as spiritually speaking, of course. We're not advocating physical violence for anybody, but they just roll right over for these uh, people that are coming against God and resisting Him and contending with God, and they just think that somehow they're going to win them over by, by just rolling over on their back and, and belly up. But that's just not the case. The Bible says the wicked flee when no man pursue it. Yep. And it's a sad thing today when God's people are fleeing from contentious, ungodly, heathen people. You're there in Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 28, verse 4. They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. So here now we're getting into a good contention. It, that's a good contention right there. When people are uh, you know, contending with those that uh, are wicked, with those that for, are forsaking the law. And we, we see that today. We see people who are forsaking the law, and what do they end up doing? They forget, they forget the law. And they even get to the point where now they're even you know, praising and condoning the wicked. And <clears throat> the Bible says here that such as keep the law, those that uh, understand and know God's word, they contend with those people. And that is a spiritual contention. Again, we're not saying that we need to take up arms and go out and resist people physically. But we, by all means, we need to be contending against the wicked uh, in the pulpits of America, at the doorsteps in America, and in every place that we can make our voice uh, and known and heard, we ought to be contending with the wicked. Amen. And letting them know that the wicked are wicked. Yep. And calling them out for it. And saying, no, we're not going to stand for it. We're not going to go along with it. We might not be able to change it in the short run. We might not be able to do anything about it, but that's no excuse to just turn and flee and end up in a position where we're actually going to end up praising them in a way. So it's a, it's a spiritual contention. If you would, look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Again, keep something in Proverbs uh, 28. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sor sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. So a fight is a contention. A fight is when you're bringing it to somebody else. You're not just running away trying to save your skin. You're not just trying to keep your hide from, you know, getting any scars or, or battle wounds or anything bad. This, but that it's the complete opposite of what Timothy's being admonished to do here. Timothy's told to be contentious, to go out and fight the good fight of faith, to go out and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Those are all great, nice, gentle things that we like to, you know, you'll see on, you know, somebody's grandmother will you know, knit that on something, you know, or, or have a little, what are they called, the cross stitch, you know, they'll put that, that part of the verse on there and hang it up and have a nice little scene. Because that sounds real sweet. It sounds real nice, doesn't it? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And those are great things. Those are things we want for our life. But let's not forget verse 12. It says right there, fight the good fight of faith. There ought to be a fight in us. There ought to be some contention in God's people today that stand up 
against the wicked and fight. It goes on and says there uh, in, in, in the later, in verse 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus, who before appointed Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to keep that. We are to keep that, and that is a commandment to fight the good fight of faith. That's not something, that's not optional. God's people have to be willing to contend today and specifically contend with the wicked. That is a good form of contention that we need to have today in our Christian lives. <clears throat> you know, and knowing the law, knowing the Bible, that's just what's going to help us. Because as I said in the beginning, we need to know the difference between good and bad contentions. And it's really up to us to take the Bible and know the law and know when to contend with somebody and when not to contend with somebody. Now, what is an example of bad contention or, or knowing when to contend with somebody? Well, it wasn't very long ago in this country when everybody was up in arms about the fags getting married. They are all up in arms about a bunch of homos getting married. And that was the big battle. But that's not really the battle anymore, is it? Right. You know? and, and the battle is much worse than that now. You know, that's, it, and now that's even how they're adopting you know, and that's never really been the battle that God wanted us to fight anyway. The, you know, the homo marriage, is, it's not the battle. That's not right. a contention to stand up. That's, a, that's, a, uh, that's them take, leading you down a different path. That's, a, that's, that's not what we need to be fighting over. I mean, as has been so eloquently said by others, you know, you know he, homo marriage is not a problem as long as it's immediately followed by a, a homo funeral. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Bible says Leviticus 20.13, you know, if a man lay with mankind, his blood shall be upon him. Romans chapter 1, they that do such things are worthy of death. Amen. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. Right. But they want this false narrative. They want this false agenda. They want you to think it's all about, oh, oh no, they're getting married. You know, oh no. But the problem is they're breathing. Yeah. But they're still alive walking around. Yep. That's the problem, violating other people, spreading disease. <clears throat> right. So we need to learn to pick our battles wisely and contend for the right reasons. You can see how people can seem like they're contending for the right thing, but not but really missing the point. And we really need to know when to contend and when not to contend. And we need to learn to pick our battles life wisely and contend for the right reasons. Go ahead and turn over to Jude chapter 1. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, But even after that ye had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So Paul is showing us there that he was willing to suffer contention, that he would put himself in a place of contention for what reason? For preaching the gospel of God, for preaching the truth of God. <clears throat> that was something worth contending over. Look at Jude chapter 1, verse 3. <clears throat> Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who before of old were ordained to this condemnation, and godly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a reason to contend today. We have something to fight over. To fight for the God, to speak the gospel of God with much contention. That's worthy of contending over. Contending with, with those uh, that would come in and corrupt the faith. Those that would creep in and ungodly men that would turn the grace of God into lasciviousness and deny the only Lord God. He says there to contend for the faith. So there's a, re there's a time for us to contend. There are certain areas that we should certainly get up in arms and fight over. But we might need to also pick our battles wisely in the sense that we don't let our contention with the ungodly get out of hand and become a distraction. Turn over to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. We understand that there's ungodly men. We understand there's heretics. We understand that there's wicked people out there. And you know, we, and there are certain times that we are to contend with them. But we not a, another way we need to pick our battles wisely and contend for the right reasons is to not let our contention with the ungodly get so out of hand that it becomes a distraction. As I alluded to earlier with with uh, you know the, the homo marriage, that was just a distraction from the real battle that needed to take place, from the real stand that needed to be taken. It was a distraction, and, they, and people just let it get out of hand. Look at Titus chapter three, verse eight. This is a faithful saying, 
And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are un unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he, he is knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. So, you know, we're to contend for the faith, but there's also a time to leave off that contention when we are to walk away from a heretic after the first and second admonition. You know, we're contending with them sometimes. You see, this This is something you use a lot, soul winning. We'll go to a door, we'll knock on a door, and we'll start to give somebody the gospel, and they'll say, yeah, but, and they'll have an argument. And then you'll take the Bible and correct them on that point. And then they'll still not get it. You have to go somewhere else. That's two admonitions. And the Bible says it's better for you to leave off that contention, to not contend with that person, and to just move on. Why? Because avoiding foolish questions and genealogies and contentions. Why? Because they are unprofitable and vain. The Bible says it's a vain thing and that it's unprofitable. So we need to learn that, yeah, there's good contentions and there's bad contentions, but even within that realm of what makes it, when it's right and proper and, 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 and righteous and holy to contend for something, even sometimes, even within that, we need to understand that we can get caught up in something that's just going to waste our time and learn to pick our battles wisely and contend for the right reasons. You know, another thing we need to not contend is we avoid is to avoid contention amongst brethren. I mean, nothing can slow down the work of God more than when God's own people within a church start to contend with one another. Right. And they start to have strife amongst one another. And that, that now it just becomes about some drama in the church that they have to straighten out that never should have been there just because some people were contending for the wrong reasons. Because they didn't understand right and wrong contention. And what, where the battle really needs to be fought. Where the contention really ought to be. Who it is that we really should be contending with. <clears throat> so a bad, a form, another form of bad contention is when you see the righteous contending with one another. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our... Um, verse 10, sorry. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So Paul here is beseeching them that what? That they speak the same thing. That there be no divisions. Because that's what contention brings. It brings division. It's people going against each other. He wanted them to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Because he wanted to be able to accomplish the work for God that God had for them to do. <clears throat> and what was the problem? Why is it that he, had to be, uh, that he had to exhort them to be of one mind? That there be no divisions. Because there were contentions among them. And that's what can really slow down the work of God. That's where people can, churches can get out of sorts is when they start to allow contention to creep in. And they get contentious with one another over things that are unprofitable and vain. And really, contention is something that stems from carnality. I mean, if you find a bad contention, the wrong kind of contention, whether in a church or elsewhere, I guarantee, guarantee you there's carnality involved. We're going to start to look at that. But go ahead and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised there is wisdom. So the Bible says only by pride cometh contention. You know, there's been a lot of contentious this month, and what month is it? Pride month, right? Oh, okay. Well, who's so who's who, who, there's pride involved, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's always on both sides. You know, there's pride when in every contention, but maybe there's only pride on one side. And yeah, we're contending with the wicked today during this pride month. But the pride is all on their side. We're standing up for righteousness and holiness and godliness and the, and the Word of God. Amen. And they're standing up for filth and iniquity yeah. and everything that is vile and disgusting that God hates. They're standing Amen. up for everything that God hates. Why? Because they're full of pride. They're proud. They're carnal. <clears throat> and it's really easy to get after them. And we have a good time doing it. <laughs> but here's the thing. A bad form of contention can even creep into our own lives. Pride can creep into our own lives and we can be content with one another. That's what was happening here in 1 Corinthians. That's why Paul had to beseech them. 
to be perfectly joined together because there were contentions among them. Look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. For ye are yet carnal, for as there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? So, <laughs> you know, they have envying and strife and division. That's something that all comes from contention. Those are all forms of contention. And what was the contentions? One saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. And they're each making their case for their man. And, and there's this big division there. And Paul says that when he observed that, he called them carnal. He said, ye are yet carnal. So <clears throat> whenever you see contention, you're, you know, there's pride involved. And it's somebody's being carnal. There's some kind of carnality. <clears throat> You know, this is something that can happen in, in long-term relationships. This is why it happens within churches, because people get around each other, and uh, they get to know each other, and they start spending time with one, one another, and they, you know, people start to uh, you know, let their real personality shine through, they get comfortable with one another, and then people start to find out that maybe they don't you know, click well with other people, and they start to rub each other the wrong way, and the next thing you know, you know they have contention in a church, because, because people... Uh, aren't getting along. They don't have the same goals in mind, maybe. But it happens in a lot of different long-term relationships, whether it's in a church. How about in a marriage? You know, I mean, am I the only one that's ever had contention in a marriage? You know, I mean, that's part of marriage. It's, it's contention. Right. If you would, turn over to Proverbs chapter 21, verse 19. 21, verse 19. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, a foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it says in Proverbs 27, a continual dropping in a very rainy day, and a contentious woman are alike. <clears throat> I mean, that's kind of an interesting way to put it. To say it's a continual dropping. You've ever laid in bed at night and you've heard, you know, you heard the plunger on the toilet just running, you have to get up and take the lid off. It's annoying, you know. Or you have that one drip outside, just drip, 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 drip. You know, it's not necessarily causing any damage, maybe. Maybe it's not really hurting anything, but it's not a blessing. You know, it's not pleasing to the ears. And, you know, it says here from Proverbs 21, verse 19, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. I mean, that could happen in marriage. You know, where do you think hunt, the, the idea of the hunting camp came from? <laughs> you know? That's right there. To dwell in the wilderness. Some guys read that and said, Brother, I think we got a solution. <laughs> you know? It's better to go out in the woods. You know, you know that's not the case up here in Mount Lennon. We're taking you all with us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but that's what it's saying. that It's better to, to do that than to dwell with a contentious and angry woman. And that's something that can happen in a relationship. Why? Because you have people that are together for a long term. They're getting to know each other. And, you know, there's carnality that creeps in. Pride can creep in. You know, it's kind of picking on the ladies here, but this could just as easily go the other way. <clears throat> and what contentions do is that they lead to other forms of conflict. Look at Proverbs 21. Look at verse 9. This, notice the same, uh, you know, warning here about the same person. It is a better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. Wait, I thought she was just contentious and angry. But now it's liking her unto a brawling woman. What is a brawler? I mean, that's somebody that's going out looking for a fight. That's not somebody who's just not happy unless they're at odds with somebody. Unless they got somebody to pick on. Somebody to try to put down and bring down. If that's you, that you're a brawler. Man or woman. So, the problem with contention is that it leads to other forms of conflict. And if you look at, uh, go, you're still, go to Proverbs 22. I'll read you from Proverbs 26 where it says, As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. So that's, that's really interesting the way it puts it. It says, as coals are to burning coals. So what's he talking about here? He's about adding fuel to the fire. There's a fire already there. And he's not going to let it go out. He's going to add coals to burning coals. He's going to add wood to fire. He's fueling the flames. He's fanning the flames. So is a contentious man to kindle strife. You know, a contentious person, they, don't, they like it when there's contention. They like when there's strife. 
They'll keep fueling the flame. They want there to be drama in the house. They want there to be drama in a church. They want people to be at odds with one another, whether it's with them or if they, even better yet, if they can just put two other people at odds with one another and watch them fight it out from afar. They enjoy that type type of thing. It's a brawling type of person. It's an angry type of person that does that. And it's better to be far away from those types of people than to have them around you. <clears throat> so contention is something that's kindled. It's something that's fueled. And what happens with a fire? What happens if we just keep fueling fires? Eventually they start to spread, don't they? And you can let a fire get out of control. I mean, you know, a little tiny flame can just take over and just burn down an entire you know, forest. Entire cities have been wiped off the map. That's what they're doing. They're trying to spread contention. Content, that's what's so dangerous about contention. That's why we have to be wise about who and where and what we're contending with and understanding that there's good contention, yes, but there's also bad contention because it can spread. Look at Proverbs chapter 22, verse 10. Cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. So you see how there, if you got rid of contention, you would get rid of strife and reproach. That's what contention does within a, a marriage. That's what contention does within a church. That's what contention does when somebody goes out of their way and starts conflict and kindles conflict. You have strife as a result. And it can even bring about reproach on somebody. So contention is a very dangerous thing. I mean, it's not something we need to just be flippant with. Me. And we need to understand the difference between good and bad contention. <clears throat> we need to understand right and wrong contention. That's the point of the sermon today. Why? Because it has consequences for better and for worse. If we find ourselves contending with one another for, for the wrong reasons, you know, we should seek to end it. If there's contention within a marriage, if there's contention within a church, even you know, between... Uh, children and parents, if there's some kind of contention that's not right, you know, someone needs to someone needs to end it. Someone needs to just be the bigger man or the bigger woman, whatever, you know, and just end it. Someone needs to act like the adult and just leave it. Right. You don't want the mess it brings. The Bible says it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop. You know, I I did roofing for a few years. That's not a comfortable place to live, especially in Arizona. I mean, I'm glad I didn't do that here. I did that back in Michigan. But you know, you're exposed to the elements. You can't get comfortable. All the amenities are inside. But it's better to be up there because that's how bad contention is. So if it's going on in a church, if it's going on in a family, it needs to stop. We need to leave it. We don't want the mess it brings. <clears throat> if you would, uh, turn over to Acts chapter 15. <clears throat> turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 and verse 36. After some days, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. So these guys are involved in a good work. I mean, Paul and Barnabas, they made quite the team, don't they? They went out and they started churches throughout that whole region. They went out and preached the gospel to multitudes. They've been in the battle together. They've been persecuted together. They've been in the work of the Lord. I mean, I have to imagine at this point in the story, man, these guys are like, you know, two peas in a pod. Best friends. Dear brothers in the Lord. And they're going out to do another great work. They want to go again and visit the brethren in every city where you have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take, with, uh, to take him with them, who departed from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention. So what was the problem here? They had contention. There was something they weren't seeing eye to eye on. They were disagreeing. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. You know, that's kind of unfortunate. You wonder, and we read that story and we say, well, who's right and who's wrong? Well, it was contention that was so sharp between them. You know, they, the contention was between both of them. I mean, maybe Paul was right. You know, Mark ended up, later we read that he ended up, Paul ended up asking for Mark. He said, bring Mark with you, for he's profitable. 
You know, but at this point in Mark's life, he had developed kind of a reputation with Paul as not somebody you want around him when you're trying to do the work of the Lord, when you're trying to do some serious work. But at the same time, you know, that contention could have just as easily been left off as by Barnabas and just said, you know what, Paul, you're right. Let's just leave Mark here. It's more important that you and I go together and get something done. Now, I don't know if Paul and Barnabas ever got together later and shook hands and, and talked it out and, you know, and, 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 got, and got over it. I mean, I, I'd assume they did. <clears throat> but what if they didn't? What if the rest of their life they're just like, oh, there goes that guy. They see each other at church and it's just like... <laughs> You know, they never got over it. People do that, man. People do that in churches. Well, he sits on that side. I'm sitting over here. And they'll, they'll avoid each other for years. You know, and then it's probably for the best because if they got together, it would just be nothing but a bunch of arguing. But why can't somebody just get over it? Yeah. You know? And it sounds, you know, that's so easy to say, but it's really that easy. For someone to just say, you know what? Maybe, maybe you are right. Or maybe you are wrong, but I'm still just going to suffer wrong. I'm just going to allow myself to, self to, to, to suffer wrongfully and just get over it because the relationship that I have with you, Paul, is more important. You know, the relationship, what we can accomplish together for the Lord is more important than me just being right. And that's the way it is in the church. That's the way it is in marriages. You know, it's more important that your marriage lasts and that your marriage, you know, you don't end up divorced and that your children are raised in a godly home than you being right. And if you have to just get over some contention that's probably over something trivial, he threw his sock right in the middle of the living room floor. Can you believe that guy? You know? Yeah, maybe he was a little lazy for doing that. He probably should just pick it up. But, you know, that's no reason to, you know, quit cooking dinner and just right. see and watch you starve, buddy. Right. Because <laughs> that's just escalating things. Oh, you're not going to cook dinner? Uh-huh. Let's see, let's, let's see what happens when that car needs to get fixed next time. <laughs> or you want to go out and do some shopping, and all of a sudden there's nothing in the bank account. Right? That type of thing happens in marriages. People get carnal with one another, and they start to contend and fight over stupid little things. That if one of them just said, you know, right, I'll pick up the sock. Or you know what, he's had a hard day, let me pick up the sock. Yep. Over something as stupid as that. I mean, people go down just paths that are just ridiculous. And it ends up harming marriages, harming homes. Same thing happens in church. Happens in churches too. Happened here with Paul and Barnabas. Well, I don't think we should bring Mark. Well, I think we should. Well, he didn't go to the work. Yeah, but he's, he learned his lesson. And it was so sharp. I don't know how exactly that argument went down, but they, it was so sharp that they were just couldn't even be around each other anymore. That they had to go their own ways. And of course, we know that they went out, that Paul went out and still continued to do great works. But that friendship was damaged. That friendship was hurt. <clears throat> you know, they went to those cities where they had been before, and Paul shows up, and they go, Hi, Paul, where's, where's Barnabas? Well, you know, uh, how, does he, how does he explain that one? Well, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> you know, everyone's going, Where do we have Barnabas? Where's Barnabas at? Did you notice Paul came without Barnabas? Did you hear what happened with Mark and Paul and Barnabas? So the thing is, it would have been better just to admit wrong and suffer wrongfully. It's better than dealing with the consequences. Isn't it? To just allow yourself to just get over it, suffer wrongfully, and move on and continue to work for the Lord and continue to see God bless a church, bless a family. Then dealing with the consequences that come when we get involved in the wrong kind of contention. And again, that's not to say that we should never be contentious. We have to be contentious over the right things in the right way, right. for the right reasons. And if there is contention, let's leave it off. Let's walk away from it because the, the consequences are not worth it. Let's go ahead and pray.